talked before. I'm a little animated, so if I get up, don't worry. Um, but we just wanted to share our story with you guys, our testimony, and I think it'll give you a better understanding of why we are so passionate about what we do and why we love the Lord so much and why we have discovered that there is a freedom available to even the worst of us. And so we just wanted to share our story. And I, I want to read a I want to read a text of scripture before I do. Um, while I'm turning there, Miss Connie, do you want to say anything? That a lot of times we interact with you guys and. Um, you don't really know our backstory, um, or you hear bits and pieces of it as we're talking or ministering to you. And so um, we just wanted you to know where we come from. Um, and although you're gonna hear that there's a lot of it that I can't relate to, um, I, I want you guys to be, when we're, ta when we're sharing our testimony, I want you to consider um, that I represent your family. I represent the other side of the story, because um, there's always another side of the story. Um, and so I re that's what I represent, and that's what I can bring in. And for years, um, after Jeff was even in Teen Challenge, when he was in a program, and when we got out, I felt like I still didn't have a voice. I still didn't have, um, it was always his addiction or his ministry and stuff, until um, one day um, I was speaking to a gentleman and something rose into me that just was like, I know it was from the Lord that day, that I thought, I need to share. I need to share my pain and my history and my side of the story so that they can truly understand, not condemnation and not so that you guys feel bad, so, but you, so you have an understanding of what your family goes through and what your loved ones go through. And so that's why, um, like Jeff says, that's why we do what we do. We don't do this um, for a job and this is nothing to do with anything other than um, we pray and we hope that the stuff that we've gone through um, can um, help you guys help heal and help um, so that we can relate to you yeah. amen amen so I want to read a few verses out of Deuteronomy and I'll, I'll read it again when we get done uh, but Deuteronomy chapter 2 um, and you don't have to turn there, just, just listen. It says, Then we turned and we took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And as the Lord spoke unto me, we compassed or went around Mount Seir many days. And the Lord spoke to me, saying, You have gone around this mountain long enough. Turn and go northward. Um, and, and I like to read that, even though, even though Moses is writing about the children of Israel and a multitude of people, it, it's just so relevant to even us. Because whether you grew up in a home that was churched or unchurched, we all had a moral compass, amen? We all, had a, we all knew what was right and wrong. And, and those of us that are in this room, we took a turn. We took a turn and we went into the wilderness. Some of them went for long periods of time. Some of us maybe not so long. Um, but I love how God showed up with Moses. And so I just want to, I just want to, I just want to start by saying that I grew up in a home that both of my parents loved us. Both of our parents uh, stayed married up until my father passed away. Uh, my, my, and I believe that they did the best that they could. I believe that now. But for years, I, I hated my dad. My dad was, um, he was very mean. He was very mean with his words. He wasn't. He wasn't physically abusive with us. I mean, we got spanked, but I grew up in the 80s when spanking was cool. You know, it's not so cool anymore. It should be, but it's not. Uh, but my dad was very mean with his words. He would say things to me, and I was just sharing with somebody on the way back from a ministry team yesterday that, that um, you know, it's funny what we cling on to and what we remember. My dad probably told me a lot of things, but the things that I remember my father saying were things like, you're stupid or you'll never amount to anything. And, and you know, and, and the reality of it is my dad and my mom, they were busy with their lives. And so I would try as a teen, as a kid to, to do sports and athletics. And, and when my folks wouldn't show up to those things pretty soon, man, I quit doing that. And I started, you know, smoking grass and drinking. And like, like I said, I grew up in the 80s. And so, and I grew up in rural South Carolina in the 80s, 
which the drug game was so much different than it is today. Anybody that's, that's my age knows that dangerous drugs like heroin and cocaine and methamphetamine, they were really non-existent in rural communities. Man, we were just trying to drink and get a girl and, and maybe some weed or something like that. And so I grew up like that. And then I grew up at odds with my father. And I had one sibling, I, had, I have a brother um, who honestly, I felt like he was my father's favorite and because he could do no wrong when he did do something wrong I would always get in trouble for it I was always the one that would get in trouble and so you know growing up like that and then in my teenage years especially when I was a senior in high school man we were really at odds I mean we were arguing all the time and and I remember making a vow in my senior year of high school that as soon as I could I was going to get out of that house and I was going to get a far as far away from that son of a gun as I could you know what I'm saying and so I graduated high school in April of, of uh, 1986, and by August I was in Navy boot camp. And by the end of, of by the end of 1986, I was in San Diego, California. Now, I don't know if you're geographically inclined or not, but imagine an 18-year-old boy that shakes his fist at his father and says, "You know, I'm going to be as far away from you as I can in South Carolina." And then he finds himself in San Diego, and so, man, my little my little junior pride is rising up, and I've got the world in my my hands. And and the reality of it is, I don't know if anybody can relate to your your people talking to you like that when you were. Little, but I used to always think that that it was a cop-out to say that the things that happen to us when we're little have any effect on us when we're big because we can write we can make our own decisions amen but I've grown to know I've grown to know this especially in dealing with addiction ministries that a lot of times people are told something so long that they begin to buy into the idea and then that's where I was I, I, you get told a lie long enough, you start believing the lie, and then you become the lie. And then if you were like I was, you spend your life spinning your wheels trying to disprove that lie. And so I would do anything I could to be the best at what I was. When I was in the Navy, dude, I was the best welder. I was the best firefighter. I had all of these accolades. And, and within a matter of a, about a year, year and a half, I, I remember we were out to sea. And we were tired. If you're in the Navy and you're out to sea, you're awake most of the time. You're awake all but maybe three hours a day if you're lucky. And, and I remember being down in the engine room on, on board the ship one day and we were just exhausted. And this, this, this machinist down there, he pulls this bag of, of crystal powder out of his pocket and he puts some lines on a machine and he says, sniff this and it'll help you. And I had never experienced anything like that before, but he had put some methamphetamine on that, on that table. And, I, and I'm going to tell you the truth, and some of you in here, relate, probably most of you can relate to this. That decision that I made to sniff that line of powder that day would control every decision for the next 28 years of my life. I had no idea it was going to be that powerful, but it was. It did something to me. It created something in me that, that I wanted. And, and, and although uh, I, would, I would go on and, and do many many drugs. I, there wasn't a drug that I wouldn't do. I, people talk about drug of choice. I'm like, what do you got? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't have a drug of choice. But in the beginning, I don't know if anyone else is like this, but, but I can remember drawing these proverbial lines in the sand. Amen. I, I'll do this, but I won't do that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, I'll sniff it, but I'll never smoke it. All right. Well, give me a pipe if that's all you got. Huh? I'll smoke it, but I'll never use a needle. Huh? And then, and then I'll, I'll never use a dirty needle or I'll never use somebody else. Or I'll never do heroin or I'll never do this and I'll never do that. And pretty soon there's no more lines and we're doing all kinds of ungodly things that we never thought we would do. And that was me. And that was me. Now I could go into detail about 28 years of addiction, but I'm not going to do that today. But I will say that there was, there was three major uh, incidents that happened in my life where I should have been dead. The first one happened shortly after I started. I was still on board that ship and I had gotten into a fight with my first wife and I was, I was going through some things and I was strung out on this meth and listen, I have never in my life been suicidal. And I know that that's a real thing. I know that we get so depressed in our minds that we, we, we consider those things. And some of us even further than that. I have never in my life been that way. I'm always one of them cats. I could be living under a bridge homeless, but I'm always like, man, maybe tomorrow. Huh? Maybe tomorrow it'll turn around. Let me just go to sleep, right? But I say all that to say I was found one afternoon hanging from a rope. 
and I was found just in time. I was unconscious. They had to resuscitate me. They put me in the Navy hospital. And once they found out that, that, that I didn't really mean to do it, that it was all a ploy to do something else, um, it, it, they drug tested me. And of course, I was dirty. I got kicked out of the Navy. Um, and my life would just continue to spiral. I would always have good jobs. God would always give me a good job. I would always make good money. But I, was always, I would always spend all of that money on, on terrible things. And then in 1992, I would have a terrible rollover accident that should have took, taken my life. All of, all of my arm to the middle of my back is, is mostly metal. Um, I cut my head open from front to back. I almost bled out in a ditch. On, it, this was on Christmas Eve. And, uh, and, and they told me I'd never use my arm again. And, and, and you know, God came in and he, and he changed that. And then fast forward to 1999, I was a welder by trade. I fell 40 feet off of a roof. And uh, that accident would, would turn uh, my addiction in a whole different direction because I woke up in traction. I had broken my back in many places, broken my hip, I'd punctured my lungs. It took me a year to learn how to walk again. I spent the next 15 years walking in agonizing pain like this. I could barely, you know, get around and I started taking pain pills in. So my addiction went a little bit backwards. And how many of you know that we can start taking pain pills and before long, they'll be taking us, right? Fifteen years into my pain pill addiction, I was taking handfuls of pills. And I'm not, listen, I'm not glorifying it because when I look back on it, I'm like, how does that even happen? How could I, because today, I have, my body's been clean of, of substances for ten years. And I don't, I'll be honest with you, I don't even like the way NyQuil or something like that makes me feel. Listen, I want all my wits about me. I want all, because I barely got any, right? <laughs> I want all of my faculties today and I don't even like the way so I can't even imagine how I could take 10 or 12 you know 10 milligram pills at a time several times a day but that's where I had found myself and I'm going to interrupt right there for just a moment as far as the lines that that Jeff was talking about that you guys draw we draw them too we draw them as a family member we draw the lines because I can remember <coughs> many times um, telling Jeff if you're going to use drugs I need you gone I need you out of of town I, I I just couldn't be around it and then he would do that and he'd be gone for days and I'd get worried and so then I'd erase that line and say okay as long as you're out in back or in the shed then at least I know that I can <coughs> you're on our property and then I would worry that I was gonna find him dead so I'd erase that line and I'd say okay as long as you're in the house in a different room because then at least I could catch the, the overdose quicker, right? Year after year after year, and so at the end of Jeff's addiction, I would walk into our home every day with him in our living room, doing the very thing that I'd said years before that would never happen in our home. And so the, draw, the lines get dr uh, drawn for us, but we erase them. We erase them because we think we're helping or because it eases our mind, you know? And so that's what your family members do. They ease themselves, or I don't know, it's a sickness. It really was a sickness for me because I needed to have him close enough to die, you know? I mean, I didn't want him to die somewhere else. And so the lines get blurred for us as well, you know? You know, and, and, and you know, this is a great place for an interruption because our, our for me to yeah. try to weave some other stuff in here because you guys know us as a couple and we've been married for 17 years, but I have known this precious woman for 32 years. We have a 29 year old son together. I know it's all right now, but it really isn't. Mm -hmm. It really isn't because um, I had come out of my third or fourth rehab um, and I was only 25. 26 something like how old was that when it don't matter I don't even know I don't even want to try to do all that arithmetic yeah um, and I traveled across the country because I knew that there was a woman in California that was that liked me and was pretty and all this and so I moved to California how many of you have ever run from yourself uh, amen try to just maybe if we find another location maybe I won't show up I don't know every time I did that I always I was already there when I got there and I already had a, a hookup amen uh, but anyways and so Connie and I started dating and she got pregnant and uh, and listen she was a church lady yeah I'll and, let you speak to yeah that. and 
And so I was going to church, but in our minds we convince ourselves. So, so I had met Jeff in 91, and so then when he calls back in 93 and says he's coming to California, well obviously he's coming for me, right? And obviously this has got to be God's will, you know, that he come into my life because who else would bring, you know, a Jeff Johnson the addict back into my life? You know, it's just skewed that you, you convince yourself that this is God's will, and so he's coming back in. Now, um, he comes, shows up in 93, and um, I had been told probably five years before that that I would never be able to have children. And so we convince ourselves, even walking in the Lord, to do, thing, do things in darkness. To do things in darkness. And um, so in my mind, I convinced myself, we're getting married. We we're, we're, have this beautiful romance that the Lord is obviously shown upon and so why can't I sleep with him I, we're not, no one will ever know I can't get pregnant right the first time I sleep with Jeff Johnson <laughs> I end up pregnant literally I was just like really Lord he's like really really because we'll, cause listen, God is that good to us that well, He will expose everything. And I'd like to tell you guys, you know, or a lot of people say, well, gosh, that was a mistake. Our son is not a mistake. He's never been a mistake. He's a gift from the Lord because He changed my life in my relationship with the Lord. And so I prayed and prayed um, while I was pregnant because um, I knew I knew that Jeff wasn't all together, you know? I, I really started to see the, the writing on the wall. And so I would pray all the time, Lord, if this, this man needs to be removed from my life, you need to do it now, you know? And uh, during this time, I was, I was strung out on heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine because where she's from is like 11 miles from Mexicali, from the border, and so all of those kind of drugs are, are cheap, and uh, it's, it's just a terrible place for a drug addict to live. And she lived in her mom and dad's house while she was pregnant, like four or five miles from the little farmhouse I lived in. I had a great job, and um, but drugs, they do something to your mind. I don't know if y'all know that or not. <laughs> Sometimes you can just trip out. I don't know if that's ever happened to anybody. <laughs> so one night I was so jacked up and all of a sudden I thought, man, this lady's trying to trap me. I ain't ready for kids. I ain't ready for kids. I'm not ready for all this. I'm a mess. And so that night, listen to me, that night I loaded everything I could fit into my pickup truck, grabbed my dog, and we left. Who's, wait, 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 wait. Whose pickup truck? Mine. Whose dog? Mine. Whose, whose stuff was in the back of the truck? Mine. You know? Yeah. But, but listen, Miss Connie, has, uh, <laughs> Miss Connie has always been the way that she is now. Every morning, every morning, every morning of the week, on the weekday morning, she would come over, she'd have my breakfast burritos, she'd have my lunch, she'd bring all that. We'd sit and have coffee. Uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? So can you imagine... Can you imagine this woman pulling up to my house on, on just any given morning and the dog not being there and then she opens the, opens the door and I'm gone, there's no note, there's no nothing and for 10 years, for 10 years, I wouldn't look back. For 10 years, the only time she would hear from me, mm, I don't even want to say this, it's not something to be proud of, was when I was locked up, I'd send a little note with some money slips. For 10 years. For 10 years, um, I didn't meet my son, I never talked to my son, and I had no idea that my son was <laughs> praying for me, that my son wanted his dad. He didn't just want a dad, That's she right. can speak to that. Yeah, he was, I mean, at a very young age, he used to tell me, um, Mom, I miss my dad, and I'd say, you don't know your dad. And he'd say, but I miss, I said, do you miss having a man in the house? Do you want me to get married? Do you have, and he said, no, I miss Jeff. I miss Jeff. And he would pray. He would pray for Jeff, not knowing where he was at. And I was the, I was of the, the type of woman that I never spoke ill of Jeff. I never did. There was something deep within me that had this, um, Parents, maybe listen to this. promise this. from the hope, from the Lord, or just a hope that one day he would be okay. And so how do you continually 
tell your child everything that you really want to share with your child and then he grows up and he meets his dad and his dad's a wonderful man so then it was on me you know and so I wanted my relationship to be pure with my son and so I we would pray for Jeff um, here's another thing can you imagine in 10 years um, you know and pro this is probably not a really a good thing to say about myself but in 10 years I never got married I never got married um, and I, I often wonder why but it's because the Lord was you know and I dated and I came close to thinking that maybe this but Josh always my, my focus always went on to Josh and whether I should marry another man and it's had nothing to do with that I thought this was going to happen again I just never wanted to um, to taint any relationship with my son and me with somebody else in our lives. And so, um, Jeff, and, and so I always say this to moms and dads, it doesn't matter whether you ever get back together with your partner that you have a child with. You need to honor them, good or bad, whatever, whatever they're doing in their life, because they are the mother or the father of your child. They, that's it. You chose someone to have a child with so I would say at one moment it was okay or but it doesn't matter they need to see a man or a woman stand up and show honor to another parent because for any reason that they're, this they're bound to that parent for the rest of their lives you can divorce them you can leave them you cannot have a relationship with them but they somehow had a part in making your child so honor them for that not for their lifestyle and not for, but for that moment, for that reason alone is for your children to see that you're, you have integrity enough to not speak ill, to not speak ill or not, you know, just downgrade them, you know? Yeah, yeah, man. And, and you know, cause the reality of it is she had lots of stuff she could have told our son about me. There was a point in time when I was $53,000 in arrears in my child support. I mean, I couldn't hold a job very long because they would start, I mean, they would start taxing me like $900, $1,000 a week. And so I'd just go get a different job. I just, I just ran from all of my responsibilities for, for 10 years. And, and fast forward, you know, during that 10 years of time, I don't even, I can't even count how many jails I've been in. And I've been to prison three times during that period of time. And I'd like to say, you know, I had some kind of cool rap sheet with bank robberies and stuff like that. But the reality of it is uh, things I went to jail with were shoplifting and simple possession of a scrape bag. And just, just I was a terrible criminal. I was a good drug addict, but I was a terrible criminal. <laughs> I was always locked up doing a lot more time for littler stuff than other people was. And it didn't make any sense to me. And every time, but listen, I don't know. There was something about this. There was something about this draw to the Lord that I, can, I, I, I look back and I see it over the course of my life. And many of you, as I'm saying this, I, I believe if you'll think back, God has been drawing you for many years. And so every time I would get locked up, I wouldn't fall in with the gamblers or the gangs or anything like that. I would just, I would get into the Bible studies. I would study the scriptures. I would, I would do those kind of things. I'd go to the chapel services and all of those kind of things. And every time I got out of jail, every time. I had intentions that I was never going back. I wasn't going to do drugs anymore. I wasn't going to do any of those things anymore. Anybody else? Yeah. Every time, every time. And it was always just a matter of time, even though I was walking with the Lord or I thought I was, but I, but I want to share this with you. And this is just like a little commercial. I have discovered that without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I would be back doing drugs right now. It wasn't until I experienced the fullness of God in my life that I was able. And you know, we shy away from it because of the talking in tongues and because of the running around and because of all of the, the sensational things. But let me tell you my favorite part about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The ability to make a good decision. I ain't never had that. I have never had that today. But today I can make good decisions. So anyways, fast forward to 2005. It was the last time I would do time in a Texas state jail. I was corresponding with Connie and, and she was even sharing my letters with Josh and he was writing back and I just wanted, I wanted to meet him. I was at that place in my life, I wanted to meet him. And when I, when I got released from, from, from that, that state jail, um, there was a pastor that would come and preach and uh, he offered me a, a, a travel trailer on his property and he put me to work. And, 
um, it was it was a good thing I felt like it was a good thing but the reality of it was within three months I was already dipping off we were living in Cisco I was already dipping off to Abilene and buying crack occasionally I was already you know getting my prescriptions filled again I was already doing a lot of things that I knew wasn't right but I was able to hide it better anybody know what I'm talking about the longer you go along the, the better you can hide it and so anyways in 2005, it was in the summertime, I think, uh, uh, Connie and Josh decided they were going to come to, to Texas to meet Josh's dad. And, uh, man, I can't even really talk about it because it affected me so much. It's one thing to have a son, but it's another thing to know your son and meet him, you know. Uh, man, when, when that, the way that that boy, how many of you have kids? Y'all know what I'm talking about then. The way that that boy looked at me, I mean, I knew who I was, I knew what I was, but the way that Joshua would look at me, and you know what else was really neat, that that whole week he probably said mom and dad a million times. It was almost like he just wanted to say it every time, you know, we were going mom and dad this, mom and dad that. And uh, of course, they flew back to California, and man, it was about a week, and I, I just, I couldn't take it anymore. And so I told Howard, I said, the guy I was working for, I said, man, I gotta, I gotta leave. I gotta go to California to be close to my son. And so I moved out there in August of 19, uh, of 2005, and it wasn't part of the plan. I just wanted to be close to Joshua, but by December, we were married. December of 2005, we were married. Josh walked his mom down the aisle, and I was, I was and, I was and, loaded and I want to I want to mention something because I know that Miss Jess was talking about something um, about that and it made me think of it um, so when jo Jeff came back it wasn't part of the plan but we started to date and all I saw was Josh wanting his parents back together I love Jeff and I knew that he loved me but I still knew that there was parts of him that needed work but I was going to be the savior. I was going to fix it. If Josh and me could make him change, or we could, he was going to, we were going to rescue him. And so I never sought the Lord. I'm telling you the honest truth. I never sought the Lord whether to marry Jeff in December of 2005. I walked down the aisle and my husband was high. I knew it. I looked at him. I looked at our son and I made a decision made a decision to do something that I should have never done. I'd say that I, I should never have married Jeff at that moment because I wasn't his savior. I wasn't going to change him. He was never going to choose Josh and I over the drugs in the, situ in the state that he was in because he didn't know the Lord, you know? And so we, we, we make those decisions to date and we make those decisions to, to hook up with people never seeking the Lord, you know? But let me tell you something, a few years later, this little girl was belly aching and seeking the Lord for a way out. I mean, seriously, I would go to the Lord and I'd say, okay, release me from this marriage. I need to be out. I, I, I want, I want, I don't, what did I do to deserve it? And I'm telling you as clear as day, he would tell me, you didn't come to me when you were gonna get married to him and now you're coming to me to get him out. He goes, I won't release you. He did. He says, I won't release you. I'll get you through this, but I will not let you out. And so we make decisions based on our own flesh and our, uh, what we want, never seeking the Lord. And then we want him to rescue us from it. And so I'm telling you the next eight years of just Jeff's addiction was the hardest thing I've ever been through. I have been through a lot of things, but I'm telling you, watching somebody you love, deteriorate and treat your our son the way that he did and treat me the way that I did because I believe I was a strong woman and I was I, I knew I knew who I was you know I mean I was I, I thought I knew who I was but those eight years I was torn down emotionally we were torn down financially there was there was nothing left of me there was nothing left of me at the very end but I knew that the Lord would get me out of that. I mean, it drove me deeper into God's arms. It really did. It drove me to a place um, that after the last time that Jeff, because 
by this time, Jeff is living, our son had gone away to college um, in 2012. And so he had gone away to college. And so we were just existing, you know? Je Jeff had moved into his room and we, I was just literally just going through the motions of, of, of this life, of just not knowing what to do, you know? Um, and I had had enough. But, but then fast forward to 2013 and, and to where she was at, you know, Josh, like, like she said, Josh, Josh went to college in 2012 and I moved into his room and it was just, we lived together, but when we had words, they were ugly. Um, listen, I never hit my wife, but I scared her sometimes really bad. I would hit the wall right next to her head or I would, I was just, I was, I was, I was an idiot, man. I can remember one time I flipped the dinner table over, um, it was full of food just because Josh didn't respond the way I wanted him to and he was like 13 you know that's the kind of house that we that we lived in I was just a rageful maniac um, but I want to get to the to the to the good part I want to get to the God part because I think that's the most important part and so and it's going to be really trippy it's going to be crazy but God's trippy I've come to know that God is yeah I mean and I don't mean that Lord in a you know how I mean it Lord you know my heart um, but but Connie's right she would walk into the house every day and and there I was just in my recliner if I was awake I was I was either drinking whiskey or I was I was I was just all jacked up man right there by my table right there on my table was pill bottles and weed bag whatever I wanted you know I was just I was very blatant with it and um and the thing about Miss Connie is, is she's always served the Lord. And that Joshua scripture, I think it's 1-8, that says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Every home that we've ever lived in, she's always put that on the wall. Even the one that we have now. And, and that house that we lived in in Heiko, when you walk in the front door, it was stenciled on that back wall. And so that's the first thing you see when you walk into our home. And then if you look over to the left, you'll see me polluted in my, in my, in my chair. And, and this is just what the Lord showed me. She didn't tell me this, but, but she walked in the house one day and, and she walked over to me and she shook me awake. And she says, I can't take this anymore. You got to get out of here. You've got to, you've got to leave. You've got to move. You've got to, you can't, I can't live with you anymore. And, um, you know, I'd like to say that I was a man and I just grabbed my stuff and I left. But, but what I really did is I looked her right in her eyes. And I told her she was stupid. I said, that's the most ridiculous thing. I said, we can, I'm not hardly working any. We can barely afford one place. How are we going to afford two? You know, just, just get out of my face, you know, get in the kitchen and cook something. I probably said something like that because that's how I would talk to her. Um, but Connie is a, if those of you that know her already know that she's a very strong willed woman. And when a woman gets something on her mind, she make it happen, right? So it was about two days, maybe three days later, she walks in the house and uh, there I was again and she came over to me and she said, listen, you have got to get out of here. And she held out these keys and I said, what are those? I mean, we barely had any money. I don't even know how she made this happen. She said, these are for your apartment. I got you an apartment over there in such and such as barn. Uh, it, it was a, a little old studio apartment and stuff. I don't know how she did it, but I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Miss Jess. I looked at her. I looked at the keys. I looked at my table with all of the stuff that I really liked and loved. And I grabbed those keys and I got some things and I went to that apartment. Because now I could go over there and I could do my dope. I could do my whiskey. I could do all everything that I wanted to do. And I wouldn't have to listen to all that nagging and carrying on. And I'll tell you what. It was the most miserable two weeks of my life. I had no idea. How many of you know that God can get in the middle of the worst thing that ever happens to you? And I don't know if this has ever happened to anyone else, but it didn't matter how many pills I took. It didn't matter how much stout weed I smoked or how much whiskey I drank. I could not get high. I couldn't feel it. I was miserable. All I could feel was this anxiety. I, the only way I can describe it is spiritual depravity. I like that word to describe how I was feeling. It was something that I'd never experienced before. And listen, I've been in city jails, county jails, state jails. I've been homeless. I've been under bridges. I've been in bad situations. But there was something about this two weeks in this apartment by myself with these drugs that just got me to this place of 
just nothingness, just brokenness. And I remember I had burned all of my drug bridges. I couldn't get anything on front anymore. I didn't have any money and I ran out of my prescription. And I knew I was, it was getting ready to get bad. I was getting ready to get sick. And so I went to my doctor. I went to living in a small town. Everybody knows everybody. Our kids played sports together. And I went to, I went to my doctor and I, and I told her, you know how we do it. I said, man, somebody got in my truck. I just, I don't know what happened, but I'm getting, I'm out of, I'm out of my pills and I need this and blah, blah, blah. You know how we do it. And I talked her into writing me my prescription two weeks early for 240, 10 milligram Percocets. A week later, a week later, I opened that bottle and there was four pills in it. And, uh, and that's when it got real. And you know what's funny, and I just remembered this. I didn't know this at the time, but the same day that I went to the doctor, mm -hmm. Miss Connie, she's a woman of fasting, if you don't know that. She began a fast. Um, and it wasn't a fast for me. It was a fast because she wanted out of the marriage again. She was she wanted some relief. She was she was seeking the Lord for for what to do next. She just didn't want to stay married to me. And uh, but a week to that day is when I would open that pill bottle and look in there, and there was four pills in it. And I remember I put the lid back on it, and I looked at it, and I'll never forget this. A, a teardrop fell right there where it said codone. <laughs> I'll never forget it. And, 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 and it, that's huge because I don't cry. I don't cry. I make people cry. You hear me? You would never catch me crying. I mean, that's just who I was. But there was something going on. I knew I was getting ready to get dope sick. I knew it was getting ready to get ugly. But there was something else going on inside of my heart, inside of my spirit. And I remember as that teardrop fell on there, I remember praying. And it wasn't some long-winded prayer. It wasn't like, God, I'll do this if you do that. All I could, honestly, all I could get out was, God, please. God, please. And listen, my wife and my son, they went to church all the time. I would go to church. Anybody go to church in your addiction? I would go to church and the preaching and, and stuff would affect me in such a way I'd find my way to an altar. I'd kneel down at an altar in church and there would be tears. I would feel the presence of God. All of those things. And then I'd get up and I'd mix a shot in the parking lot of the church. I'd shake my fist at God and say, God, why won't you do something? Anybody else ever do that? Because we hear of people that's been delivered. And I'm like, God, why can't that be me? But God would reveal to me the reason why. See, prayer is a powerful thing. But if you pray and repent, listen, God's hand will move on your behalf. And there I am with this pill bottle. And there I am knowing I'm getting ready to get sick. There I am with no other options. I didn't know who to call. And so who do you call when you don't know who to call? Your wife. <laughs> and I wasn't looking forward to it because I didn't know what to do. I mean, the last time we spoke, it was ugly. I mean, it was, it was very ugly when I left the house. And I remember calling Miss Connie and I didn't know what I was going to say. You know, we try to, addicts, we try to piece together something that'll sell. And, uh, and she answered the phone. She was at work and, you know, cell phones, it tells you who it is. She said, what do you want? That's how she answered the phone. And the only thing I could get out was, I'm done. I'm done. That's all I could say, those two words, I'm done. And what she said next opened the floodgates. That one tear was getting ready to turn into a crying that still hasn't stopped. And she said this, she said, well, you need to get your things together and get home so we can figure it out then. Blew my mind. Because I had begged many times before, baby, I'm done. I promise. I ain't going to do that no more. You know what? I'm going to put all the money back. I'm going to look here. I, I promise. You, you feel me? And so to say that and then that be her response, I'm like, I'm like just all wadded up crying, getting stuff in my little duffel bag, trying to figure out what in the world is going on. I'm just like, I'm a mess. I'm a mess. I'm like, what in the world is going on? But God would reveal to me that that's how he has to do things in lives like ours. And, and, and the way he showed me, it's almost like he drops these little breadcrumbs of faith. Amen. 
And if we'll take one step of faith, he'll drop another one and another one. And pretty soon, man, look here, you're walking 10 years with the Lord. That was just one of those little breadcrumbs of faith. And so, and so I'm getting all this stuff together and I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to go home. And, and as I'm going home, I have to drive by the church that her and my son go to. And the pastor's pickup was there. And so I thought, I don't even know why. I just thought, you know what, I'm going to turn in there. I need to try to, I don't know what I'm doing, you know. I just know that I need help. And so I went in and I, I talked to her pastor and and uh, I told him, once I told him how messed up I really was, because you know, you live in a small community, people know you're jacked up, but they don't know how bad. And I started telling him, he's like, man, come in here, sit down, let's see what we can do, you, you know. And so we, we get on the, he gets on his computer and I, I, t I just tell him, you know, what I'm going through and, I, and I, need, I need help. And so he gets on the computer and, and you know, Texas is a huge state, there's thousands of recovery ministries, thousands of addiction ministries in, in Texas and recovery centers and stuff. And so he gets on the computer and he's looking and all of a sudden he pauses at this one and he said, well, here's a place in Azle, Texas. So it's called Teen Challenge and, and we go through the whole, well, I'm not a teenager thing and blah, blah, blah. You know, we get to the, do we realize it's a men's place? And, and as he's looking at it, he says, yeah, but you're not gonna wanna go here. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it says it's a year long. And uh, out of me, before I even had a chance to think, I said, I don't care. Because in reality, when we get to the place where we want help, it won't matter how That's long right. it is. On. So somebody that comes in here and they, and they say, well, I don't know if I can do a year. Well, chances are you're not at that place yet. Because once you get at that place, it won't matter how long, will it, Nate? It don't matter how long, does it? And I said, you know what? It don't matter. And he said, well, let's call. And so we call. And we're talking to the guy, his name's Jonathan Moore, I'll never forget it because it, it was a conversation that I'll never forget and, and we grew to be friends. Um, he starts telling me about the program and telling me all of this and that and I'm, I'm starting to feel hope. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Start feeling a little bit of hope. He's telling me about it and then all of a sudden he says, he says, but, but, but we have a, a $1,500 intake fee. And I just think, it's like, Man, when you when you get to the place of brokenness where I was at, you're at a place of brokenness too. Amen. <laughs> I'm like, I ain't got fifteen hundred dollars. You're tripping, man. Do you know who you're dealing with here? And uh, and he says, but I'll tell you what, we won't worry about that. We won't worry about that if he can get here next week. We'll just figure out something else. And I would grow to know later on that that's just the way that they do it, you know. But. But in that moment, it was like a breadcrumb. It's like God was for me. Even though I was a mess, somebody that doesn't even know me is going to cover my cost. But then he said, he said, but if he's taken everything that you say he's taken, he can't come like that. We're not a medical facility. You know, we can't detox. He's got to be detox first. Man, my heart sank again because I don't know if anybody in here has ever went through opiate, which I bet most of you have. It ain't no punk. <laughs> It ain't no punk. I didn't like running out for a minute. Uh, and so he said that I had to be detoxed and you know, living in Heiko, Texas, it's not like living in the city where they have detox facilities where you can detox comfortably. <laughs> Whoever came up with that? That didn't even <laughs> detox. Those two words don't even go together, right? <laughs> anyway, so now I'm faced with, and I'm gonna get to the good part. It's gonna get mm -hmm. fun in a minute. So now I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to wean myself off of these pills. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I got four pills. <laughs> huh? And so I get, so, so I'm sitting at the house. It, husbands, you guys will get this. I'm sitting at the house and I've already got a plan. Huh? Because we always lean on our wives to come up with a plan. I'm sitting in the house. I'm watching the doorknob, waiting on Miss Connie to come in so I can say, you know what, I've got a plan. And, and so she walks in the house and I said, I said, baby, I got to tell you something. She said, don't call me baby. And I want to tell you something first. That's right. I said, all right, you go first. And she said, she said, check this out. She said, well, when I got off the phone with you this morning, I had a few minutes and I got on the computer and I started looking uh, for a place. I started looking at some things and, and you know, there's a place in Azel. And I'm like, Azel, I ain't never heard that word in my life. And now I've heard it twice in a matter of hours. <laughs> and she said, yeah, I talked to this guy named Jonathan. And he said that if you'll call him every day while you're going through the withdrawals or while you're detoxing, he'll hold a bed for you. 
Same thing he told me. Jonathan wouldn't find out till later that we were the same person. But God was weaving things right. together. God was showing me that he was in the middle of it, even when it was at its hardest point. And so I said, well, well, I got a, I got a detox. I said, you got anything in the box? Now you got to know what the box is. The box is a little lock box that we, we still have it, but we keep like money and valuables in it now. But she used to keep pills in there for when I would get rageful and violent. She would go, listen, she would go and get prescriptions for non-existent problems just so she would have some medicine on hand when I would get in those fits of rage. That's how, that's how distorted our home was. I said, you got anything in the box? And so she went, she had about, I don't know, 15 or 16 hydrocodones. And so I got these four and I'm like, okay, we can do this. I said, so how are we gonna do it? And she holds up her <laughs> bottle and she says, well, it says on the bottle, take one tablet every four to six hours as needed. And I looked at her, I said, baby, that'll never work. And she said, well, we just won't do nothing then. <laughs> and I said, no, nah, we'll do that. Yeah. Let me get one. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny, but... But the reality of it is a man that's taking a dozen pills at a time and he thinks that one is going to, man, I, I really believe all I did was prolonged it, prolonged it. So she starts giving me one every, and, and man, within, within the second day, man, I was, I was sick. I was bad. I didn't sleep for eight or nine days. I couldn't eat. I was, I was, man, I was, it was, it was rough, wasn't it? Yeah. She was, and she was there through the whole thing. And she even took is, off work through some of it. This is the part that, um, where your family has, um, it, it, it pulls at everything within you as far as your, your heartstrings, your emotions. Um, I don't, I don't think that people don't go through withdrawals and I don't, I, I know that it's awful, but on the other side of it, holding your husband as he is just throwing up and all just everything you know he is just dying in your arms and you're in the shower with him just trying i mean i was it was like the worst thing that i had ever seen a human being go through he wasn't sleeping he wasn't eating i was just trying everything in my power um, to make him comfortable the difference is i had the relief in my hands at any given moment, I could have given him something to take the edge off. And too many times, that's what happens in family members. They see you hurting, and, and they see this pain that you're going through, and they just want to help. They don't want to see you go through that pain. And so they'll go get you some alcohol. They'll go get you some drugs. They'll, go get, they'll do anything not to have you go through that. But I knew that I knew in that moment that I would lose my husband, that he would die if I gave in and so I sat for nine days just holding him and just bathing him and just watching him go through this um, because I, I knew I knew that just around the corner there was going to be a victory to it I just there was something in it you know but your family suffers through this I mean they want they don't want to see you go through pain and so in their minds they're like okay well here's something just to take the edge off well let me tell you something it took everything that I had in my power to, to not do that. And praise God I didn't. Amen. Amen. I even started cutting them in half. Yeah. I did. And she comes to me with a half a pill one time. I'm like, what in the world is that? She said, well, you're running short. We're trying to wean you, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then that was about the same time that, so, so my wife has these four lifelong friends and a couple times a year they get together and they do girls trips, right? Huh? And this particular girls trip that they had planned on this particular Friday was to go to San Antonio and run a marathon. Dude, you won't see guys getting together to go run unless we're doing Come something. On. Well, maybe some of us, huh? <laughs> hey, you won't see me doing it, yo. <laughs> I mean, unless somebody's after me that I don't think I can beat up. Because even if I think I can beat you up, I ain't running. But anyways... So she was gonna go run this marathon and she's like, I'm just gonna, I'm just, I'm just not gonna go. I don't know about y'all, but how many times have we ruined our people's stuff, right? We ruined the events, we ruined this or that because we go to jail, we wreck a truck, whatever it is. 
And so I didn't want to do that again. I was really committed to this thing. And so I told Miss Connie, I said, I said, look here, you just go, man, I'll have somebody come by and check on me or something. I'm not going nowhere. I promise I'm going to be all right. You know, because I really felt the resolve inside of me, even though it wasn't there like I thought it was. Um, and she said, well, all right, but go out on the porch. And so <laughs> like, what in the world? She said, just go out on the porch. And so I went out on the porch and she came back in and she says, all right, I'm getting ready to leave. She says, and I'm going to call you because I thought she would give me what was left of my doses, you know, be like one last hurrah, right? But no, she didn't want to do that. So she had taken those pills and hid them all over the house. And she told me, I'll call you when it's time. And so I'm at her mercy to call me when it's time for my little old dose. And uh, of course, I thought I could find them. And just, you know, but I couldn't. Man, you live with a drug addict. She, and, she, and later on, I would find out she used to always find my stuff and throw it away. I thought I was going crazy. Anybody ever lose your stuff? Huh? That, you didn't lose it. Your people found it and threw it away because they love you. But anyway, anyway, so, so she goes and Friday night when she gets to San Antonio, she calls me to check on me, uh, tell me where my little dose is. And, and by this time, I'm already like seven or eight days into this thing and I'm, I'm eating a little bit, I'm sleeping a little bit. I still got the, I don't know what y'all call it, the heebie-jeebies, still got, I'm still super anxious and stuff. And as a matter of fact, Saturday morning, I would wake up almost like it was at the beginning again. Has that ever happened to anybody else that's going through a draw? It's almost like you're over the hump and then all of a sudden that monkey just jumps on you. And I'm telling you, it was bad. It was so bad that I called somebody something I said I wouldn't do. I called, I called a guy that lived down the street from me that always had drugs, always had drugs. And I told him, I said, man, you need to, you need to swing by, man. I'm in a bad way. Can you, can you come by? And he said, man, you're not going to believe this. I don't have nothing. <laughs> and under normal conditions, I would have threw my phone across the house. I would have started destroying things. But when he said that, I felt something that I had never felt before. Even though I was alone in my house, I felt like, I felt like the Lord saying, even when you're weak, I got you. I'm here. I got you. You're not, gonna, you're not going back. You're not going back. And so I made it through Saturday. Sunday, I got up and I walked to church. And I had to walk to church because she took my truck keys. Um, I walked to church, but it wasn't that far. And, and listen, man, I, I experienced God. Like, I don't remember what the message was about or anything. But I felt the presence of God like I'd never felt it before. Never. And uh, some folks took me to lunch and they dropped me off at the house. And I remember I was sitting in my chair. I was sitting in my chair and I was flipping through the TV channels. And I wasn't looking at movies or sports. I was, I was up on the, you know, the TBN and all the church channels way up on the 400 or whatever it was. And uh, as I was surfing through the channels, um, this song that was on one of them caught my attention and I paused on Sun Life, Sun Life Broadcasting. Anybody ever heard of that? Jimmy Swaggart and them, that man, they're, they're all right. Um, but what caught my attention was the song. They were singing about a camel train. Anybody ever heard a song about camels? Me either. <laughs> me either. Never in my life had I heard a song about a camel. And when I heard the word camel, I paused and I started listening to the words and, and let me back up. So Saturday night, Miss Connie calls me from San Antonio to tell me where my medicine is. And before she hangs up, she says, I feel really impressed to share with you about my devotion tonight. And I said, all right. I mean, I don't know about y'all going through withdrawals, but I ain't really trying to hear much except where my stuff is. But I said, okay, go ahead. And she said, well, in the Old Testament, there was this woman named Rebecca who was getting water at the well one day when all of a sudden this man comes along with all of these camels. And she tells she proceeds to tell me the story about Isaac and Rebecca and Eliezer, the, the servant that comes. And she says, and, and she watered all of these camels and, and she did all of this stuff. And I'm like, all right, where are we going with all this? She said, you don't understand. The very next day she rode out on those camels and all of those camels belonged to her. And everywhere where the camels came from belonged to her. And she was the mother of the promise. And I'm still like, well, okay, what has this got to do with anything? 
And so she tells me of how tedious the job was to water that many camels, how much camels drink, and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, all right, I'm still not getting this. And she said, you don't understand what you have put me through. You don't understand how long I have been going through this mess. But the Lord spoke to me that my camels are coming in, and they're my camels, and I'm going to keep watering my camels. So that's how I went to bed on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. On Sunday morning, at 2.30 in the afternoon, they're singing about this. And so I stopped and I'm sitting there and I'm just watching. And I've never seen church like they do it. They were running around and, you know, kind of like we do it. I didn't know that that's what people at church does. But and so I'm watching all of this and, and they're singing this song and everybody's just worshiping the Lord. And all of a sudden the music stops. Everything stops. And uh, Donnie Swagger fills my TV screen. And he's looking. And look here. He wasn't looking at the audience. He wasn't looking at the camera. That dude was looking right into my heart. And he started talking. And he started speaking. And he said, there's somebody out there who's going through something that you just can't seem to break free from. You've tried, you've tried and tried. And you just always find yourself failing. He said, today is your day. You know how them TV preachers do it. Today is your day. And then he walked over to this man about Bronson's size. Stand up, Bronson. He walks over to this man about Bronson's size and he puts his hand on his shoulder and he says, this man was dying in his addiction. He lived in Georgia and he was watching our, our, our television show and he decided to drive down here to Baton Rouge. And he came right down here to this altar and he knelt down. And Donnie said that 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 this man he, he, that knelt down there, he, he would get up every morning and he would count his pills and he would count his money and he would try to figure out how he was going to get through the day. And he was dying in his addiction. And so he decided to drive to Baton Rouge that maybe he could find hope and maybe he could find freedom. And he ended up at our altar. And Donnie said, I put my hand on his shoulder and I told him, I said, pray this prayer after me. And he said that that big man looked up at me with tears just streaming down his face. And he said, you don't understand, preacher. I've prayed a thousand times. And man, I could feel everything that he was saying. And Donnie said, the Holy Ghost inside of me didn't even skip a beat. He said, I looked down at that big man and I told him, why not one more time? And when he said that, the lights went out in my house. <laughs> I don't even remember what happened. All I remember is one minute I was in my recliner and the next minute I was picking myself up off my floor in my living room and I got up to my knees and I was just crying and I didn't know what happened but, but I felt different. The, the, the withdrawals were gone. The desire to even smoke cigarettes was gone. I had this different feeling about life. And I believe in that moment, before I ever even knew what it meant to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire, I believe in that moment that's what happened to me. I didn't speak in tongues in that moment. You know, I, I don't bind myself to, to certain doctrinal beliefs that it's got to be this way because I still believe God can do it however He wants to. But I got, up to my, I got up to my chair and I was sitting there trying to figure out what had just happened. And all of a sudden my cell phone rings. And I picked it up. Guess who it was? Stoney. Stoney, the dude that I called the day before. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm almost up by your house right now. He said, I just, I just got a bottle of Oxy's. I can drop something off. What do you need? Something that I had never been able to do in my life came up out of me without even thinking. I said, bro, I don't take those anymore. And I hung up my phone. And I went to sleep. Still had the pain in my back. Still, I, I hurt. I mean, I hurt bad. I hurt for years. I hurt so bad that I would have to call my wife or, or my son when I was almost home so that he could come out and help me out of the pickup. I went into Teen Challenge, I could barely move. I'd been there, what, about two or three weeks. Those of you that were at the ministry team with me yesterday heard this already, but I'd been there two or three weeks and it was on a Sunday night. We were at a little Pentecostal church that it was our home church and I wasn't in the prayer line. I wasn't, I wasn't asking for healing. I was, just, I was just worshiping the Lord when He healed me. 
He reached down from heaven and he touched me. And I haven't, haven't had pain in my back since then. Haven't had pain in my back since then. And, and you know, that year at Teen Challenge, there was so much other things, that, so many other spiritual lessons that he would teach me and Connie. And we had no idea why. We thought we were just regular people. And we really are just regular people. But, but I chose in that moment to get all in with God. And I have been all in with God ever since. And he has been so faithful to take care of us. Jeff truly decided to put me at the altar, to put Josh and I at the altar and leave us alone, to, to take his hands off of us and surrender us because he, he couldn't worry about us. I mean, he had never really worried about us anyway, you yep. know? Um, and now you're gonna be in a program and you're gonna be worried about your family. You know, how much more is he gonna take care of your kids and your family now that you're getting it together? So he put me at the altar never to pick me back up again. And what I did, um, because I would look at him and I would tell him, th and there were some key things that happened. I looked at him probably after three months of being in the program and I said, what if this isn't gonna work? What if I can't do this anymore? It, I, I've now, you know, just, uh, you've been gone from the house and what if I don't um, stay in this marriage? And he's, I'm serious, this is what he said to me. He said, I would be sad and I would miss you. And it would really grieve my heart, he says, but I have to do this. I have to do this. I can't hang on to a relationship uh, that's more important than the relationship with the Lord. And I saw something start to shift in Jeff and I start to, started to see that I was no longer the focus uh, of his life, but the Lord was. And um, I shared this with somebody the other day, I think it was Miss Anna, I was sharing that I remember, I'll never forget one, uh, Jeff had been gone probably about four or five months and I was in this pity party. And I'm telling you, your families are going to play a part in this. They're going to feel um, the need to tell you that they miss you, that they, that they're, um, yeah. that, um, yeah. that they, they want you in back. And I mean, all these different things and they're gonna pull at your heartstrings. I did want Jeff back, but more than anything, I wanted him to say that I, he wanted to, to stay. But I remember thinking to myself, I was just having a bad day. I was having an awful day and I, I wanted him back. I wanted him back to come back into the program and I, or to, to leave the program. And um, I remember that night in the middle of the night, um, just crying to the Lord. And, I, and this is that, that point when he was telling me, you know, I, I, I mean, he was real with me. I mean, in all this stuff, you know, and he said, um, he's not coming back to you the same person. And so you can't be the same person. You know, you can't be the same person because it would never have worked. And so that night, it was probably in March of 2013, is when, 2014, when I got, 2013, when I got my relationship with the Lord back on track. I really believe it, it took all that time because at that moment, in when I was laying in bed, God became my father. He became my best friend. He became everything to me. My husband, I mean, my lover, everything. In one moment, he became everything. And I realized in that moment, and I need you to hear this, and, and a, a lot of times when I say it, it sounds harsh. I love Jeff Johnson with all my heart, but I don't need him. I need Jesus. I want Jeff in my life. You see, for so many years in our marriage, we were needs. Jeff needed me to clean up the mess and I needed him to have a mess so that I could clean up. That was where my purpose and my worth was. And Jeff was just a mess. And so we had this sick codependent need for each other. But in that year, we, we just like almost detached, chased after the Lord and then the Lord said, okay, now you can have that back. You know, and, and so we became, when we came back together after that year, I was a healthy woman that would, was able to say, I, I was able to draw the lines and stick to the lines. He was able to draw the lines and we, I mean, we can see those lines in each other, you know? Uh, we learn so much and so what we have now is so healthy. It's a healthy relationship because I don't need him. I need Jesus. Listen, Jeff, if Jeff were to ever leave, I'm telling you the truth, and, and, or die, I would miss him, my heart would break, but I need Jesus much more. I will always love the Lord, and I will always put the Lord above Jeff. 
And I know a lot of times that sounds harsh with, with couples because they're like, this is my everything. He's not my everything. Jesus is my everything. You know? And when you get to that point, you realize that God blesses you with something that becomes your something. You know? That, that verse of scripture that I read in the beginning, I want to read it again. And I just really want you to hear me. It says, Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. As the Lord spoke to me, we compassed or we went around Mount Seir. Moses said, Many days. Isn't that funny? How, I mean, I don't know how many of you know how long they went around that mountain. Anybody in here know how long they went around Mount Seir in the wilderness? Huh? Almost 40 years. Almost 40 years. Isn't it funny that Moses would say, we went around this mountain many days. And one day, one day when I read that, one day when I read that, it, it registered with me. Because I'm not like some of you youngsters. I, I, man, I've been in this addiction mess for years. But we get up in this grind of addiction day after day after day after day. And we do the same thing. We do the same thing. And then we turn around and our son's graduating high school. And we're in this rut going around this same stupid mountain. Then we turn around again and he's getting married. Then we turn around again and our hair is gray. Then we turn around again and, 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 and what? I don't know. You put your thing on it. But isn't it funny that Moses said we went around this mountain many days? You see, because when you get in the rut of addiction, it might seem like just a matter of days. But when you turn around and you realize, man, you've been in this stupid grind for years and years and years. But the Lord showed up and told Moses, man... Look at here. <laughs> You've gone around the mountain long enough, Bronson. It's time to turn. And I love the direction that he said. Turn and go north. Because if we had a map on the wall, which way would north be? It would be up, wouldn't it? I want you people to hear me. You guys have gone around this stupid mountain long enough. Some of you have been in, this is your third and fourth and fifth program. You can't figure out why you can't get it right. Listen, it ain't about the program. Our, our desire running this program is that you would meet Jesus. That you would have an encounter with Christ like I had. That changed the direction of not just my life, but my family's life. Because this boy that grew up in a house with a raging drug addict, this, this boy Joshua that we talk about, me and him are like this now. I talk to him on the phone all the time. His daughter, it, my granddaughter, she loves me. It's because God was able to restore it because I took a turn. I, I took a turn into the wilderness, but then I turned and I got out. So you have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. You have an opportunity to take not just my story, but take what's offered to you here at Project Hope and Saving Grace. And don't get caught up in the grind of, of the plaque making or the, or the GSNCs or all of that kind of stuff. Listen, we got to do that, but chase after Jesus chase after the Holy Ghost if you don't believe in it don't take my word for it Run, study the scriptures it's Bible it's not it's not denomination it's Bible amen I love you guys I was going to do an altar time but I just really want you guys to just ruminate on that is that a word ruminate <laughs> no. meditate <laughs> resonate just meditate soak it in amen Amen. Let me pray over you guys. Mm -hmm. Father, we love you. We just thank you so much for our stories, God. It, it might be our testimony, but God, really, it's your story of redemption in our lives. God, I pray that something was said this morning that, that everyone in this room could take hold of some piece of it. I believe that testimonies are so powerful and so important because as they are in the atmosphere, we can reach up and take hold of portions of it and claim them for our own. Lord, I pray that you would bless every one of these men and women in this room. And I pray that not only you would bless them, but everyone who's attached to them. Whether it be their husbands or wives or their parents or their children, Lord. I pray that you would just minister to, even to the families while these, while these folks are here, Lord. And God, I pray that we would be able to trust you with our families. That we would be able to, as I did one time ten years ago, put our families on the altar, in your hands, God, and leave them there and trust you to work it out God. God I believe that you are working things out that these folks have no idea about. 
God, I pray that you would just reveal them, that to them in their hearts and their minds. And God, that you would bring them to a place of trust. As the song says, trust without borders. God, that's what we need. We need borderless trust in you. God, I just pray that you would bless the rest of the day with these folks today, God. And I pray that the joy of the Lord would rise up in both of these programs. And a spirit of unity would just continue to, to, to grow stronger and stronger. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.